So I call this talk, Once Upon a Time of You, The Transformative Potential of Personalized Fiction. Okay? And as I already revealed, <clears throat> there I was taking my cruise missile out for a walk. Actually, that's not this story. As many of you probably know, that's Richard Dean Anderson of MacGyver. And for those of you who have questions about MacGyver, I promise when we get to the question and answer period, I will attempt to answer all your questions about MacGyver. But that is not this particular story. And we will get to that story in time. This story starts at the dawn of human civilization. And if you recognize this photograph, unfortunately the lights kind of wash things out. They're much more dramatic on my computer. But, um, this is, this is from 2001, A Space Odyssey, and you should be hearing, you know, also spake the Zarathustra in your head, right? Dum, 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 da dum, 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 dum. Okay, I, I don't sing for a living, which is a good thing. Um, and the reason this story starts at the dawn of human civilization is because I am going to try and convince you tonight that humans are a narrative species. Now, what do I mean by that? Humans are a narrative species, okay? So, we know, come on guys. Well, that's interesting. There we go. We know that virtually all other species that we've examined on this planet communicate. Dolphins communicate with clicks and chirps. Chimpanzees, I don't even know if you can see these guys. Chimpanzees obviously communicate with facial gestures and hand gestures and vocalizations. Uh, bees dance to tell people, uh, tell their other fellow bees where the honey is, okay? Whales sing, but even, in fact, plants communicate, although most of them don't get to Broadway, okay? This particular plant did get to Broadway. But most plants, like this, even these plants communicate. They send out chemical signals, they warn of trauma and distress, but none of these species, as far as we know, tells stories. Whales don't say, what if I were a man? Bees don't say, suppose I were the queen, okay? None of these species, as far as we know, tells stories. Only we tell stories. Further evidence. Every night, every one of us dreams. And actually, not just once a night, we usually dream four to five times a night. Now, there is no scientific consensus, by the way, as to exactly why we sleep more than we know exactly why we dream. But there is no dispute about the fact that every night, every one of us dreams. The dreams may be fantastic. They may be absurd. They may be fattening. They may be frightening, they may be romantic, but every dream is a story. It is a sequential series of images, impressions, emotions. It is a story. Now, I would conjecture, this is just me personally, that What's happening when we're dreaming is the external stimuli of our day is being mashed, and I use that in a technical way, with the internal stimuli of our subconscious, and out comes this story. But the fact is, it's always in story form. We do not dream in text. We do not dream in charts and graphs. We do not dream in code, although some of you who are up all night coding may in fact see some coding in your dreams. But the truth is, every dream is a story. It's a narrative. I'll go even further. 
Watch me. Watch me go right out on a limb here. Every experience we have, every decision we make, is based on a story. Every product you buy, you buy because it coincides with a story that you ascribe to that product. Why do you buy one car over another? Why does that car appeal to you? Why does Madison Avenue spend billions of dollars trying to make that car appeal to you? Because they are trying to tell you a story that goes with that car. The same is true of cell phones. Why do you buy one cell phone instead of another? Yeah, it's about the features and stuff. Not true. The cell phone manufacturers and you are looking to create the story in which that cell phone fits into your life. Every relationship you have is a story. You imagine when you meet somebody where this could go. You live a life of that relationship and it is in fact a story that you are creating together, but it is a story. Every political campaign, every political movement, has a story behind it. Every politician, what do they do? They spend most of their time and money trying to sell you a specific story. This is who I am. Right now, Hillary Rodham Clinton is traveling across the country saying, guess what? I know there's a lot of people who don't like me, so I have to rewrite the Hillary Rodham Clinton story. And how does she begin that story? I'm the most famous person who you don't know. She needs to reinvent the story of herself. Every religious impulse or spiritual impulse is based on a story. Where does man fit in relationship to God or heaven or the afterlife? All stories. I'm going to take it a step further. It's a cool slide. I don't know what it means exactly, but it's a really cool slide. Your entire experience, whether you are fully aware of it or not, is a story. The past, the present, and the future. So, what is the present really? There really is no such thing. That's the present. Now it's in the past. Wait, wait, here it comes again. It's gone. The past are those things that have happened to us, which we now call the facts of our life, right? You got married. You had children. You used to sled on toboggans. You went to Stanford University. These are the facts of your life. But that's a story. And the future is a story. The future is what you think is going to happen, or what you want to happen, or what you fear might happen. At that point, it's a fiction. It only becomes fact once something actually happens, <clears throat> and now it is in the past, okay? But whether it's past, or future, or even present, it is still in story form. The future, Cancer cured, flying cars, Star Trek, okay? So, let's examine this distinction between truth and fiction. Past is a fact, although most of you who are neuroscience and know memory is a kind of fluid thing anyway, so the way we actually remember things and the way they actually happen, there's a little kind of wiggle room in between those two things. But, but let's for the moment examine what we call truth. I mean, the truth itself is, is a fluid thing because at one time the Earth was flat, and it wasn't. And the sun went around the Earth, and, and it didn't. And Newton pretty much explained how stuff worked until Einstein came along and said, yeah, not so much, right? So, but let's, let's accept that there's something that we all consider and call the truth, okay? So now I want to do a little thought experiment with all of you, if you'll indulge me, okay? I want you to close your eyes for a second. I promise I won't change the slides when you're not looking. 
I want you to close your eyes for a second, and I'm going to give you two statements. And I want you to gauge your reaction to these two statements, OK? Statement number one. Let me tell you what happened when I traveled here today. I thought it was going to be a routine flight, but it wasn't. That was statement number one. Here comes statement number two. Once upon a time, long, long ago, in a land far away, there lived a creature the likes of which the Earth had never seen. OK, now you can open your eyes. So here's my question, quick show of hands. Was there any difference between the first statement and how, it re how you reacted to it and the second statement? Anybody feel any difference between those two? Raise your hands if you felt the difference. I'd say, OK, anybody who felt there was no difference between those statements? Wow, OK. That one worked pretty good. That was the most unanimous. OK. It's a scientific idea. Like, there you go. OK. So when we hear something we think is true, we may be interested, we may be curious, we may be excited. But there's a critical element that comes into play. Because we are asking ourselves, do I believe this? Does it coincide with my experience of the world and the way the world works? Do I buy this story? The second statement was obviously fiction, right? First statement was claimed, seemed like it was going to be a true story. Second statement, once upon a time. When <clears throat> we think something is true, we look at it differently than when we think it's a fiction. Now, let me see if I can demonstrate that to you in a couple of examples. They will seem perhaps trivial, but I still think they're profound. So I have now four grown children. I am also blessed to have four grandchildren. One of my grown children actually even went to Stanford. Um, when they were growing up, and I would say, let's say they're three, four, five, six, and I would say, it's time to go to bed. Invariably, they would say, no. Why should I go to bed? You're not going to bed. Now, you know where this dialogue is going to go, right? I'm in for a war. Instead, I used what I call the puppet strategy. I put a puppet on my hand. And the puppet says, I'm tired. I want to go to bed. Can we go to bed now? And I look at the kid, and the kid says, oh, OK, I'll go to bed. Aww. Now, they can see the puppet is on my hand. <laughs> they can see my lips moving. It did not matter. They would go to bed because the puppet said it was time to go to bed. I guarantee you, if you have children and grandchildren, this will work. Sometimes it works with adults, but that's a scarier subject. But <laughs> why does it work? It works because I have taken what was a true factual encounter, and I have added a fiction to it. I have fictionalized the issue of staying up or going to bed. I have created a story now around going to bed. These, by the way, are the puppets I now entertain my grandchildren with on Skype, because they got tired of looking at my face. And so I went, puppets, puppets. This is uh, Lucky, this is Penelope, and this is Kitty Bitty. Just so you know, should you run into them sometime, you can greet them by name. Similar story, a friend of mine who is now a, I guess he's a director at DARPA. He was recently uh, profiled on 60 Minutes. They called him DARPA Dan, OK? And we were talking about this, and he said, oh, yeah, totally. He said, my kid, when he was like five or six, kept getting up in the middle of the night and coming in and waking us up. We went, this, this, this can't go on. This is not going to work. So when they put him to bed, he told him, 
the floor is now molten lava. And if you get out of bed, you will burn your feet. And in the morning, they would come in and they'd put pillows down so they could walk across the molten lava, and then they would pick up the pillows, and the lava was gone because, you know, lava's kind of a nighttime thing. <laughs> now, did his six-year-old son really believe that the floor was molten lava? You know that kid stuck his foot out of the bed and put it on the floor, but it worked. Why did it work? Because now the kid was part of a fiction. There was a story to not getting out of bed, and he could participate in that story. He had a way of looking at that situation. It was now a fiction that he was part of, and it offered him the choice to participate in the fiction. The kid could have easily said, there's no lava on the floor. Screw you, I'm getting up in the middle of the night. But that's not what he did. And that's generally not what they do. Because they like the fiction. As a matter of fact, we all like the fiction. So here's the question. What's that? OK. White screen. There we go. OK. So here's the question. Does this preference for fiction carry over into adulthood? Or is it just something that works with kids and puppets and molten lava? OK? And I would say it does. So An Inconvenient Truth was one of the top 10 most successful documentaries of all time. It made $50 million. But the fictional movie about climate change called The Day After Tomorrow made $500 million. Okay? Then there was, there have been numerous documentaries about the Titanic, one even made by James Cameron himself called Ghosts of the Abyss. It made, come on, $17 million. The fictional story of Titanic made over $2 billion. Same basic story, but the fiction is a lot more attractive, even to us grown-ups, than the truth. This is a snapshot of Amazon's daily gross sales by ebook category. And you can see, you read, these stuff, you read this stuff better than I do, I guarantee it. Like 70% is fiction, and maybe 30% nonfiction. Same as holds pretty much true with the, you know, the gross dollar amounts, but OK. Why is it that in literally the most technologically advanced society that we have created, certainly that we know of, OK, where the access to information, you know, you hit, you hit a button on Google, you know, you get 1,975,000 pieces of information with regard to what it is you asked about. Okay, not that you ever go through all of them, you usually only go through the first top 10, maybe 20. Why is it that with more access to journalistic information than we have ever had before, why is it that we still prefer fiction to truth. Well, the truth hurts. More often than not, the truth is complicated, messy, sometimes painful, sometimes unpleasant. We want the truth, we say, but more often than not, Truth hurts. Not only that, the truth tends to be unbelievable. Now, I can tell you, as having spent my entire career writing fiction, that when I came upon a true character, an actual historical character, an actual, an act, an <coughs> excuse me, an actual historical event, I always had to tone it down. I always had to soften things because if you gave people the actual truth of what happened, 
they would go, oh, we, uh, that's unbelievable. Uh, no, that can't be. That can't be. And so I would have to fictionalize the truth to make it credible, which seems entirely paradoxical. But I'm telling you, I sit with the network and they go, yeah, you can't do this. Why? Because nobody will believe it. You go, but it's the truth. They go, yeah, but it doesn't matter. Nobody will believe it. You got to change it, Lee. Go, OK. The other problem with the truth is the truth demands change. If you accept something as being true, inescapable, undeniable truth, very often it requires that you now have to see the world differently. You now have to adjust your thinking or your behavior or both. And guess what? Most of us don't like to change. I mean, we are all about the world is changing. Change is constant. Let's change everything. Except what I want to do, because I don't really like that much change. We don't really want change. Change is hard. Change is awkward. Change is difficult. Ask a smoker. How easy is it to give up smoking? Or an alcoholic? Or a drug addict? How easy is it to change these things? How easy is it to get off your ass and go to the gym? You know it's good for you. You know you need to do it. Do you do it? Change is hard. Fiction, on the other hand, allows us to look at things, even true things, in a way that does not demand us to change. In fact, we may be moved to change. And I would argue that the reason we can be moved to change is because fiction gives us the freedom and control of choice. It's just a story. So I can decide not to listen to it. I can decide not to take it seriously. I can dismiss it because it's just a story. You're not telling me this is the truth, even though the truth may be deeply embedded in that story even though you may find yourself moved to action by that story. But because it's not declaring itself the truth, you now have the option to either embrace it or reject it. And that option and that choice is extraordinarily meaningful and powerful. So now what? Let's say that I've been successful in convincing you that we are a narrative species and that fiction is fundamentally more compelling and perhaps effective at communicating than truth or fact. What do we do with that? Is there any way to make use of that with the advances in technology? Could there be such a thing as personalized fiction? And if so, how would it work? What would you use it for? Here comes the best part. I know because it says it right there on the slide. So about a year or so ago, a friend of mine who calls himself a polymath, I said, you can't call yourself a polymath. Nobody knows what that is. You probably know what a polymath is. It's someone who does lots of different things, OK? He said, I have a challenge for you, Lee. I said, I'm always up for a challenge. What? He said, I want you to think about what the next generation of entertainment is. I said, what do you mean? He said, I, he said, I don't mean like 3D or IMAX. I'm not talking about gimmicks. I mean like the next quantum leap in entertainment. What would that look like? He said, OK, let me think about it. So using my soon to be published MacGyver method, which some of you will get to experience tomorrow. I asked myself that question, and then I promptly went on about my business. And then when I was stuck in a particularly uncomfortable economy seat on a cross-country flight, which 
I'm sure many of you have enjoyed. I said, okay, I'm stuck here. This is uncomfortable. This is unpleasant. There is probably someone who is much too big for the seat they're in sitting next to me. Let's revisit this question. And so I asked myself, what could the next generation of entertainment be? And one line came to me. And that line was simply, what if the main character of the next story you read is you? Just that, just that line. What if the main character of the next story you read is you? Now, this was, I'll call it a MacGyver moment or a Eureka moment. I suddenly exploded with that possibility. Now, had I jumped up out of my seat like the gopher in Caddyshack and went, oh my God, I would have been tackled by a sky marshal and handed over to the FBI when we landed because that's the way it works on airplanes these days. So I don't know why that damn gopher is dancing, but be that as it may. So, the, so, so I thought to myself, okay, how would this work? How could this be? The reality of entertainment and education invariably has followed this model more or less since time began. You make something. It's a book. It's an idea. It's a play. It's a movie. It's a TV series. It's a textbook. It's a pedagogy. And you try and get as many people as possible to buy into that, right? Fifty Shades of Grey. Whatever. This idea, though, I realized not only am I turning that model upside down, I'm turning that model inside out. I thought, OK, my son wears a Fitbit. Everybody's taking selfies. Everything is moving towards customization. You buy something on Amazon, it says, hey, if you bought this junk, you probably want to buy this other junk. And I thought, OK, this could be a game changer. What if we could take fiction, which I think is infinitely more powerful in compelling people to change than truth or fact, and what if there were a way to personalize it? What if the next story you read, the main character was you? Well, by the time I got off that plane, I had decided this was worth pursuing. Now, to tell you the truth, I had no idea how this would be done. I am a storyteller. I am not a technologist. It's not what I do. But I knew enough, and you probably know infinitely more about artificial intelligence, I knew enough that there was probably a way this could work. And I decided that I was going to go hunt that dragon down and take its treasure, or it was going to eat me in the process, because that's kind of usually what happens with dragons. And so I began a search. First thing I did was obviously share this idea with my friends and colleagues, just to see if like I was on the right side of crazy, you know. And most of them said, that sounds cool, but how are you going to do that? I said, I have, I have no idea. I mean, really, I have no idea. Um, but sometimes complete ignorance of things is a blessing, and I was completely ignorant enough. And I figured, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wander in the forest of my relentless optimism for quite some time before I find out how this is going to be done. Well, as fate would have it, literally within weeks of having this epiphany, this revelation, a friend of mine said, you know, there's this guy on the internet. And suddenly, I discovered the sword and the stone. And the sword was named Phil. 
Now, Phil does not look like your epic dragon slayer, but I needed to get the sword out of the stone, and I was going to do whatever I needed to to do that. And his full name is actually Philip M. Parker. So, Philip M. Parker, turns out, has been using a technology on which he has the patent called automated authoring. And he saw a hole or a failure in the publishing market. Because we only publish in about 40 languages around the world because it doesn't pay to publish in other languages. But he said, but what about all those people who want to read textbooks or dictionaries or classics and it's not published in their language? I bet I could build something that would provide them the opportunity to have access to those materials in the language of their choice. And so he proceeded to do that. Between books under his own authorship and books under the authorship of his company at the time called the Icon Group, he has a million titles on Amazon. He is the most prolific author on Amazon, because he doesn't actually write the books. You say, I need a textbook in Swahili that teaches math from the third grade to the fifth grade. And you go on Amazon, and you tell Amazon what book you want, and an algorithm assembles the book, and it goes to print on demand, and you have your textbook. So. A little more about Phil. Phil is a chair of economics and management at INSEAD University, which is one of the top, it's an international business school, one of the top five business schools in the world. Not as top as Stanford, but, <laughs> but still one of the top five business schools. And although he's from Southern California, he lives in Singapore. So I thought, all right, nothing ventured, nothing gained. I'll write him an email. What's the worst that can happen? He doesn't write back. And, shamelessly, I admit, I play the MacGyver card. Hey, I'm the guy who created MacGyver. I'm thinking about doing stuff. And on his bio, somewhere at the bottom, it said, yeah, I've been doing this in textbooks and dictionaries, but you know, I'd really love to find a way to do this with fiction. I thought, OK, this guy's looking at the same dragon I'm looking at. So I contacted him. And we began communicating by Skype. We had three or four long, interesting, intense Skype conversations, and StoryMine was born. StoryMine is the name of our company, the goal of which is to develop and promulgate personalized fiction. Now, let me talk about how it works, in case you already figured out how it works. But in case you had, I didn't know how it worked. And I said, Phil, OK, now we both signed our NDAs. OK, what's the secret sauce? And so he started to tutor me on how this works. OK, so more or less, Every story fits into a genre. The genre could be superhero, spy, detective, romance, 100, maybe 150 genres. After that, you start kind of getting into things in between, you know, like on Pandora. I want Ricky Lee Jones and Jimi Hendrix, you know, on the same radio station. But pretty much most stories fall into a genre. Within that genre, then, you have core elements. Okay? If it's a superhero story, you need a superhero. You usually need a supervillain, too, but, but basic core elements. Story paths, what is the conflict? What happens? Outcomes. Pretty straightforward stuff. So let's take Let's take a particular genre, all right, and let me see if I can walk you through it, all right? So, romance novels. Turns out when you look at it like a chart, which is like, what is the easiest thing to do in creating 
personalized fiction and like what is the what is the market what is the highest market value of something you end up with romance novels most popular form of fiction in the world okay also one of the most formulaic forms of fiction in the world but more romance books get sold than any other books okay so let's break it down in romance you have protagonists okay how many different protagonists can there be story about a man and a woman story about two men story about two women story about a threesome story about a foursome story about a guy and a robot even if you have a really vivid imagination after about 20 or 30 you're out you pretty much exhausted who the protagonists are going to be okay then you go to the next category what are the conflicts oh he's rich she's poor uh, he's Romeo she's Juliet their families hate each other they're both married he's married she's divorced go down the list again the combinations may be infinite. The selections of variables, not infinite. You're going to hit, after about 25 or 30, you're pretty much hitting rock bottom. You've covered them all. Response to conflicts. They fall into a secret passionate affair. They have numerous sexual encounters. Or one fantasizes about the other and they have casual encounters but the love is unrequited or they're madly in love with each other but because of time and other circumstances they can't actually be together same thing you just go down the list there's only so many choices resolutions they find each other they live happily ever after they don't find each other it's tragic Romeo and Juliet. They love each other, ends tragically, right? Or they recognize that they both love each other, but they can't have each other. Again, only so many choices. So, you also have other variables, like setting. There are seven biomes in the world. Desert, tundra, arctic, temperate, urban, suburban, another list, right? Time periods, Elizabethan England, ancient Rome, Byzantine, you know, uh, Syria, only so many choices. How sexual do you want it? Well, you've got a guided user interface with a slider, all the way from chaste and euphemistic to pornographic. You can slide it up and down. I want my story hot. I want my story tepid. You build a guided user interface with all those choices. You put your you put your information in. And then to make this template work, we hire writers. Actual human writers. And what we do is we give them very specific, defined things to write. Okay? Describe a city in the desert. Describe uh, uh, a rural setting. Okay? Describe all the body parts on a man. Describe all the body parts on a woman. I know where you're going. Let's say her hands. Okay, how many different, you give a dozen writers the challenge of writing about a woman's hands and fingers, guess what? It becomes pretty clear that there's like 25 adjectives to describe hands and fingers. They're delicate, they're muscular, they're calloused. After about 25 adjectives, you're done. There just aren't 150 or 1,000 adjectives to describe a woman's hands or her fingers. It gets down to breaking everything down into what I'll call written Lego blocks. Okay? And so now we have our romance template and we've had our writers create our Lego blocks 
And now the user sits in front of that guided user interface. And we say, put in your name. Tell us as much or as little about yourself as you choose. It's up to you. It's your story. OK? Pick the things you want. Now, my guess is, you know, most people will probably give them 10 variables on the first page. And if you don't like any of them, then you can go to the next 10 variables. Most people are going to pick probably from the first 10 or the second 10. Maybe some people will go to the third 10. But the truth is, most people are going to put in a minimal amount of information and say, surprise me. I want to see what the story looks like. And then we do what's called snowflaking. So all romance stories are fundamentally the same. And yet, like snowflakes, every individual story is different. Algorithm one, based on the input they've given us, amasses those pieces together into their personal story with their name as the main character in whatever configuration they chose. And after algorithm one compiles it, it actually goes to algorithm two. Now in algorithm two, we've downloaded and annotated like 50 great romance stories. So algorithm two looks at what algorithm one has done and says, does this now coincide with what I know a romance story to be? If it does, great, ship it. If it doesn't, then it goes back to algorithm one and says, yeah, this doesn't align. You've got to change something. And if it all works as it's supposed to, when you hit that button, within 30 minutes, the story comes back to you. And now you're looking at your own romance story. And you can have more chapters. And if you don't like it, you just go to the guys at user interface and you change something. I don't like the way this, I don't want it to end tragically. I want it to end happy. OK, not a problem. Whatever you want, you plug it in, it'll write it. So now we have this. Well, obviously, the implications for entertainment and gaming are obvious, right? Especially because we can add video, animation, that gets more complicated. So Phil and I looked at this hard and said, OK, probably not best to start with a commercial broad spectrum user experience. It's a new concept, spend a lot of time, energy, and money getting people just to understand what this is. Are there things that can be accomplished more quickly, more easily, to start introducing this concept into the underlying fabric of society? And the answer was yes. And we came up with four key markets. Education, family histories, self-help, and something we call the public sector. OK, Ooh, how do we get there? OK, so I'm going to talk about, is, is, I see a lot of you are yawning. Have we like hit our limit? Should we just go on to the MacGyver questions? Because if you want me to stop, I can, I can just skip all this stuff. OK, OK. So education. Uh, why do it in education? Well, all right. These are just a few really sobering statistics. Kids now look at reading as work. If it's not a text and it's not a tweet, they don't really want to read it. In the US, one in four children can't read. The literacy rate has remained the same for the last 10 years. Reading by choice, that is 13-year-olds and 17-year-olds were asked, how often in a, given, in a given year do you pick up and read something, not because you have to for school, but just because you want to? And the answer was, that has declined by 30% over the last three decades, OK? So you can just imagine where that line is going, right? They don't want to read, because it's hard, because it's work. So there's a lot, and you probably know this again better than I do, there's a lot of new research 
that says personalized learning makes a huge difference. In fact, the Gates Foundation has done a fair amount of, of research into this, okay, and has published several articles. But what does personalized learning really look like? Because the fact that most of our school <coughs> systems are losing, you know, are, are struggling for dollars, it's a logistical impossibility for most teachers. The classes are getting bigger, okay, and the teachers are being forced to teach to the test in order to protect their jobs or in any way advance their circumstances, okay? So how would personalized learning work? Come on, okay. Everything in education that we're thinking of is based on this simple present, I'm sorry, premise, which is what kid wouldn't want to be the main character of their own story? particularly if they got to choose what the story was about, what the genre of the story was, and, if, you know, and any, any number of other variables that the educational system of the teacher was comfortable with, what kid is not going to read that story? Okay? Even the most disaffected and disinterested kid, if I said, you want to be a superhero who can do this, this, and this, and it takes place here, here, and here, and it's got your name as the main character, you mean to tell me that kid's not even going to look at that story? I bet that they would look at that story. I bet that they'd swallow that story whole because my friends in the education business, in the trenches, on the front lines, in the worst schools in LA say, the problem is not with the information. The problem is turning on the frickin' light. If you can turn that light on in that kid, they will go through grade levels of reading in months. The problem is that initial engagement. The kid has to want to be engaged. And if they don't, you can have the most sophisticated technical crap in the world. It doesn't matter. It's just bouncing off a shield. All right? So we came up. Whoa. That's weird. I don't know what happened to the other books. We came up with three programs in education. The first we call Connecting to the Classics. That should be Macbeth, and that should be the Red Badge of Courage. So junior high, high school, we can even do this on an elementary school level. Kids have to read classics. It's part of the curriculum, right? How many kids these days do you think get excited about reading Moby Dick or Macbeth? or the Red Badge of Courage. I don't disagree that there's value in those books, but they don't see it and they don't see the relevance. So he said, suppose we could build a bridge to these books. So suppose we said to the teacher, you pick 10 genres that you think your class would be interested in. High school sports, ballet, skateboarding, hip hop, edgy urban, whatever. Your school, we got hundreds of genres. You pick 10 that you think the kids would like. You tell them who the characters in these stories are and say, who do you want to be in this story? You want to be Macbeth? You want to be Lady Macbeth? You want to be Queequeg? You want to be Ishmael? You want to be Ahab? And then in that genre, that kid becomes that character and we give them the story of Moby Dick in the genre of their choice with them as the main character. So now you're reading the story of Moby Dick, but it's in the world of skateboarding. Or you're reading Macbeth, but it's in the world of hip hop. Or you're reading the Red Badge of Courage, but it's in the world of high school sports. Let's say you're going to take three or four days to do one of these books, usually at least a week, if not more. One or two of those days, the kids get those stories because the kids and the teacher can go it, put in the user interface, half hour later, bam, there's the story. Everybody read your story, let's talk about it. And then we're going to read the original classic. But now they've experienced the story of Moby Dick in a way that feels relevant to them. Now they've read Macbeth in a way that feels recognizable to them. Now it's just not weird old English on a page that doesn't make any sense to them. Now they have an investment in that story because they've been in that story. 
Will it work? It's only one way to find out. My guess is it will work. We have another program we called Right This Way. Same thing. Here are the genres. Who do you want to be? So forth and so on. Do your guided user interface. We write chapter one. You have to write chapter two. We'll give you a couple of prompts. This is what has to happen in chapter two. You send it back. We write chapter three. You have to write chapter four. And suddenly now, that issue of writing as being terrifying and overwhelming becomes, but I'm writing my story. Yes, and we're prompting you to write your story. And by the way, at the end of the semester or the year or whatever it is, you can print out that book that you just co-wrote with Storymine, and it's your book. And now you've written a book, and you may be 10, 11, 12, 15, but you've written a frickin' book. And it's your story, because nobody else has that story. Last one in education, we call it reading up on yourself. So, same basic premise tailored to the specific reading level of, of, of a kid, right? Not everybody in the class has the same reading level, but they're all reading the same stuff at the same time because that's the way curriculums work. Say to the teacher, tell us where this kid is, and we'll write the story for them right on their reading level. And then with each successive chapter, we can carry them up a level. We can add more sophisticated vocabulary. We can add more sophisticated sentence structure, we can guide that child in their own story to a higher reading grade. And it's their story. What kid is not going to want to read that story? Okay, that's education. Family histories, Ancestry.com, right? Your great-great-grandfather was a Civil War hero. Your father was a hero in World War II, your parents had an amazing love story. You always wanted to write a book, but you're not a writer. Not a problem. You send us a history, you tell us, do you want it to sound like Michener? Do you want it to sound like Hemingway? Do you want it to sound like, you know, I don't know, pick your author. We'll write the book for you. Potentially huge market. Potentially huge market. Birthdays, weddings, anniversaries. Dad, I'm giving you a fictionalized version of your amazing story and mom's. Okay? Obvious. Self-help. That's one of my favorite slides, by the way. You just know that that thing is going to get that plug in there at some point. So, so huge publishing market. What do we know about self-help? What do we know about people actually being able to change. You want to start a new career. You want to start a new relationship. You want to lose 50 pounds. You want to quit smoking. Whatever it is, in order to be able to get from point A to point B, you have to imagine yourself accomplishing that. You have to see yourself getting there or you will never get there. So guess what? You tell us what genre story you want. You tell us what your aspiration or goal is. And we will take you in that fictional story step by step, and you will see yourself accomplishing that goal. A whole new avenue of self-help. Fiction. I can choose to believe it. I can choose not to believe it. It's just a story. But in that story, you're a superhero who has now lost 50 pounds. Right? You're a detective with a broken heart who has now somehow found a new relationship. Whatever it is, we can take you there. Now, I began sharing this with friends of mine, some of whom turned out to be therapists. And they said, you can really do this? And I said, yeah, we can really do this. They said, this would be huge in therapy. I said, what do you mean? They said, you don't understand, the toughest thing to do in a therapeutic situation is to get that frickin' patient to think differently, to think outside of the whole, you know, hamster cage that they're caught in, to see themselves moving beyond where they're stuck, be it neurosis, psychosis, whatever it is. 
They said this would be an enormous tool for us. We could sit with the patient. We could decide on the story together. The story pops out. We can each read it separately, come together in the next session and say, what did you think of that? Did it seem like you? Did that seem like something you could be doing? Huge potential for this tool. Again, in a safe format, because it's fiction, right? I was sharing this with some friends who work for the National Institute of Health, National Institute of Mental Health. They said, we have an application you should seriously consider. I said, what's that? They said, there are 18 million children in the US alone who suffer from chronic illnesses, diabetes, asthma, cancer. These kids struggle to comprehend what's happening to them. Their medical professionals have a very difficult time communicating with them because they talk in technical terms and the kids don't understand. The parents have difficulty communicating with the kids because they're usually in a state themselves. If you could create stories that individually dealt with that kid, what their particular issue and struggle was, in the genre and format that they chose, whether they're capable of reading and need to be read to, or whether they want to read it themselves, this would be enormous. Not only that, if you could generate a glossary, because it turns out a lot of kids with chronic illnesses name their diseases. The big blue monster, the horrible green witch. If you could produce a glossary from that story so that a doctor or a nurse or a therapist could take one look at a top sheet and walk into that kid and say, how's the big blue monster doing today? Boom. That kid goes, this guy now understands what I'm dealing with. Not only that, but now the kid and the parents, and the parents can choose to share it with the brothers and the sisters or the grandparents. We now understand what this kid is going through in story form, in a fictional form, in a way that they can all approach sometimes a subject that is almost unapproachable. Because when you have sick children, there are really three outcomes. They will either recover from that illness and go on to the rest of their lives and cope with whatever trauma was caused by it, it's an illness that they will cope with for the rest of their lives and need to come to terms with in some sense, or it's an illness that they will not survive. And even then, looking at that in a story form that allows them to come to terms with the fact, parents and child, that this is not going to have a happy ending, may be profound. If you're religious, and you want the story to be about Timmy going to heaven, so what? That's the story. Timmy is going to go to heaven, and someday we're going to join Timmy there. If it makes it easier on the kids and easier on the parents, why not give that to them? We call that program, What's My Story? Finally, we call public sector. So, as Phil and I were putting StoryMind together, as it so happened, he got a project with the Gates Foundation, who said, you know what? We have all this information about best agricultural practices. Oh, uh-oh. OK, sorry. Thank you. We have all this information about best agricultural practices. And there are all these subsistence farmers all over Africa, OK? But even if we could print textbooks in all of their languages, we don't know that they could read them. And even if they could read them, we don't know that they would read them. But they all listen to the radio. And they all like stories. So suppose we could use your technology to create radio drama outlines. And what you plug in is, where is this place? What language do they speak? What are their agricultural issues? What kind of stories do they like? Turns out they mostly like boy meets girl stories. 
all those parameters. You plug in all those parameters, out pops a radio drama outline. We send it to the radio, local radio station, and all they have to do is add the dialogue. And embedded in those stories are the best agricultural practices for that community. This is an ongoing project right now. It's a multi-million dollar project that he is doing with the Gates Foundation. Okay? Because they looked at this and said, there is enormous potential for this in the public sector. I am talking to the Innovative Peace Lab here at Stanford. Is there a way to use this technology to offer communities on either side of a conflict stories that take them to a resolution of that conflict that doesn't involve them picking up guns and killing each other? Might that work? It's certainly something we're going to try and explore together. Because it might work. Because we all like fiction more than we like fact. And because it might just get us to the place where we think, maybe we don't have to kill all those people. When you then consider that we'll be able to do this in over 100 different languages, because he's already doing textbooks in 100 different languages, the possibility for global implication is obvious. Okay? So I thank you for your patience. But the real question now is, so in the once upon a time of you, What's your story? Because you are the people who are going to help us make something like this come to fruition, I believe. And I hope, if I haven't convinced you, I've at least been mildly amusing. <laughs> Thank you very much.